Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word to us, the Bible, breathed by God, written by the hands of men, preserved for us and translated in our own language so that we can read it and have it explained to us. Thank you that it's so relevant for us today, that it has the power to change and transform us. Thank you that it has everything that we need to know pertaining to salvation, which can be found in Christ alone, the living word. And we pray tonight for the help of the Holy Spirit, that we might be attentive to the words of God, that we might understand what it is you're saying to us, and in doing so, respond to your prompting. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's the old joke that says, what does the preacher mean when he comes to the point in his sermon when he says, and finally? Well, the answer, I believe, is absolutely nothing. See, at the end of the text that we studied together last week, you can almost hear James saying the words, and finally, we're coming to the final words of his breath the final strokes of his pen. Yet, like the preacher who mistakenly says that he's coming to the end of his sermon, well, well, James isn't either. James still has lots of words left to say to us. He very quickly mentions a whole host of issues, people in trouble, people who are happy, the value of singing, the anointing of Uh, People with oil for healing, confession of sins to one another, the importance of accountability, and he even throws in Elijah for good measure. All of this in the last eight verses. What does it mean when the preacher comes to the point in his sermon where he says, and finally, nothing, absolutely nothing. There's so much in these last few verses, and as we consider them together, well, Let's firstly remind ourselves of the context in which James is writing. We've heard that he's writing to a congregation that's known to him. It's a dysfunctional church where backbiting and favoritism, where prayerlessness, boasting and greed all have their sway. And throughout the letter thus far, James has called his hearers to wholehearted devotion He's rallied them to live lives that are devoted to the gospel that they've been called to. To allow what they, what they know of God to, to permeate and saturate their very beings so that their faith would impact the way that they live. It's the same devotion that we're called to today. We too are called to wholehearted living. Lives whose actions match their motto. motto. The book of James forces us to consider the practicality of our faith. We've seen it time and time again throughout the book so far, haven't we? James doesn't afford us the luxury of saying that we believe something without putting it into practice. So if we say that we believe in a God who blesses us generously, then we cannot face trials without praising God for his appearance in the process. If we say that we believe that God is love, then we can't blame God for the evil things that come our way. If we say that we believe in a God who seeks righteousness, then we cannot act, react in anger towards anyone. If we say that God has forgiven us our sins, then we can't play favorites Treating some people as better than others. Because God does not treat us like that. If we say that we have faith in God, then we can't hide that faith internally without revealing the outward result of works. If we say that we trust God's plan for our lives, then we cannot plan ahead of him. And if we say that we believe in God's time, then we must strive for patience. It's such a challenge, isn't it? Does anyone else feel inadequate for the task ahead? So 
How are we to live such lives? To live up to such a standard of love for each other and the world around us. To be wholehearted in our love of Jesus. Our worship of him. And our service for him. Well, James tells us we must be prayerful. Indeed, it's no surprise that James wishes to end his letter with a call to prayer. If we're to live wholeheartedly for Jesus, we must stay close to him in prayer. And James instructs this unhealthy congregation that they should have an attitude of prayerfulness in all circumstances. James asks in verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. A healthy congregation, James says, is one that makes prayer a priority in all circumstances. James is perhaps remembering the the good old days of the early church as we read in the book of Acts, when Acts 1.13, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Indeed, the New Testament church was conceived in the womb of prayer in the upper room from which a movement was launched that's still impacting the world today, 2,000 years later. And did their prayer life diminish once the church was established? Certainly not. We read in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The early church took prayer seriously. It remained a prayer-conditioned fellowship. Indeed, it was born and bathed and brought to fruition in prayer. Today, however, if we want to get a small crowd into church, we call a prayer meeting. We often forget that for every situation, there's a great resource at our disposal. The privilege of communicating with our maker, the one who sustains the whole universe and yet cares intimately about every detail of our lives. James has told us before, and he tells us again, to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. He loves to hear the prayers and the praises of his people. The great evangelist John Wesley is known to have said on a demanding day that he had so much to do that he'd never get it done unless he spent at least three hours in prayer. Now that's not the norm, but it serves to highlight the shifting in our priorities, doesn't it? Prayer is often at the top of our to-do lists, and yet it's often the last thing that gets ticked off. And yet we have so much to pray for. For unconverted family members, for friends, for our church leaders, our government, for ministries that we serve in and that others serve in, for those that we serve, for world news, for work colleagues, for classmates, for university lecturers. The list goes on and on. James says, pray in all circumstances. Pray when you face trials. Indeed, Turn your gaze towards heaven. And when times are comfortable, give thanks. Sing praise when times are good. Prayer will be the hallmark of a healthy congregation. And indeed, if we are to fulfill God's plans for us here at Lansdowne Baptist Church as we look forward, we must be a prayerful congregation. We must commit ourselves to prayer, both individually and corporately, that we might seek his will for the months and the years ahead. We must pray, for God's people are at their most effective when they're on their knees. Well, having instructed the church to be prayerful, James moves on to the subject of praying for those who are sick, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick, he asks. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. 
and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Well, it's no secret that these are controversial words. A misinterpretation can cause much confusion. They're the only verses in the New Testament that deal specifically with the practicalities of healing, and many have interpreted them incorrectly and caused considerable damage. Indeed, James' words here call for careful interpretation. Interpretation according to the context, the the occasion that James is writing. Certainly at a glance, it seems as though James is prescribing a fail-safe pattern for praying for the sick to be healed. But is he really saying that there's a a guaranteed method, a a how-to of praying to make physically sick people well? If he was, and there is, then why is it that we're all not healed of our illnesses when we pray. Some have suggested that it's a question of the faith of the individual. Indeed, one evening whilst on honeymoon, I was uh, flicking through the few English channels that we received in our apartment, and I was incensed to hear the televangelists on the God Channel proclaim that a sick person need only have enough faith and they would be healed. That the reason a sick person doesn't experience supernatural healing is due to a lack of faith. Now whilst James would have seen miraculous answers to prayer for those with physical ailments, and we promote praying for the sick and the anointing of oil for healing according to the will of God, I want to suggest to you that there is more going on in this passage than first meets the eye. James I believe, is using a picture, a picture of physical illness to address a much greater problem. That is the problem of spiritual sickness. James isn't concluding his letter to the wayward, immature, black, backsliding community with instructions on dealing with kidney stones. Indeed, I believe he's using the picture of physical sickness to address the deeper ailments, spiritual sickness, from which his hearers are suffering. Let me explain why. You see, not only does it fit with the context of the letter, but there are further clues that perhaps aren't so obvious, clues that we would be wise to consider together. Take, for example, the language that James uses, such as, words uh, sick in verse 14, make well in verse 15, and heal in verse 16. These words all have a certain amount of ambiguity in the original Greek, and they can mean different things according to the context in which they're used. So take the word uh, sick in verse 14. This carries the idea of weakness. It could be physical weakness, as in Matthew 25, verse 36, when Jesus says, when I was sick or weak, you looked after me. But it can also refer to an inner spiritual weakness. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. There the the sickness or the weakness is a spiritual thing. In verse 15, a different word is used by James to describe the sick person. Apart from this instance, though, it's only used two other times in the New Testament. One time is uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, when writing to Christians, the author of Hebrews, speaking of Jesus, says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary or sick and lose heart. And the other time in Revelation chapter 2 verse 3, you have persevered 
You have endured hardships and have not grown weary or sick. On both occasions, the the sickness or, or weakness is spiritual weariness. It's the the kind of uh, weariness that we often feel as, as Christians when we're worn out or, or tempted to throw in the towel to, to give up and, and turn our back on the Christian walk. But what about where James goes on to say that such people will be made well, you ask? Surely he's speaking here of uh, physical healing. Well, Perhaps not. You see, the word well in verse 15 is translated elsewhere in the New Testament as saved. It is used in relation to physical healings. For example, the woman who'd been suffering from uh, menstrual bleeding for 12 years, who simply touched Jesus' garment and was healed immediately. Jesus turns to her and says, her faith has saved her. But in most cases, it refers to a spiritual salvation. It's a restoring to God for the forgiveness of sins. Again, the author of Hebrews uses the same word for heal in verse 16, metaphorically, referring to the effects of sins being forgiven. In chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 12, it's written, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And as we've seen, the author is writing to a group of Christians who are finding life wearisome and are tempted to give up. So what I'm suggesting is that there are some people in the church to which James is writing who are suffering in a variety of ways for a variety of reasons. But the underlying reason is spiritual. Remember that James is speaking to those who, as we are told in chapter 1 verse 2, are facing a multicolored trials, testings of various kinds. Some come in the form of physical hardship. Some are poor and are getting a hard time from the rich. Some are uh, being tempted uh, towards worldly luxuries and are satisfying their sinful desires. The congregation have a a head knowledge but not a, a heart knowledge. They're being judgmental and looking down on others. They're above the law, they say. And so they're subject to God's judgment. And on and on it goes. This is a spiritually sick church that James is writing to. And in that context, to to speak of the need for spiritual healing would seem to make sense. There are those who are wearisome, backslidden. We need the elders of the church to come around them and pray for them and anoint them with oil as a sign of reconsecration to Christ. But it may also be that these people are indeed physically sick, as the text suggests, only the root of which is their spiritual rebellion against God, much like the example of 1 Corinthians 11.28, where the Apostle Paul, talking about the shameful way that the congregation in Corinth have been living, who are approaching the Lord's Supper in the wrong way, says this, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many among you are weak, the same word as James uses in verse 14, and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, says the Apostle Paul, that is, they died. Paul is saying that sometimes God will discipline Christians through physical sickness, which is a result of their inner spiritual sickness. It can be a means um, in his hands to get our attention, to get us to think through some of our priorities so that God can say to us, son, 
or daughter, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? It gets us to stop and take stock. Now, please don't mishear me. I'm not suggesting that all sickness that we endure is a direct result of sin. That's not what James is saying and not what I'm suggesting. However, what James is saying is that it is a possibility. And when someone in the body of Christ is unwell, it's wise to ask the question, is there a particular sin in my life that I'm not confessing to God? Sin which has led God to such extreme lengths to, to get my attention. There's the lovely story of a Christian minister of the late 18th, early 19th century named Edward Payson who was visited by a friend when he was sick. The friend came into his room and saw him lying on his back and said, Edward, I'm so sorry to see you laid up on your back so sick. To which Payson, with a, a smile on his face, replied, Do you know why God puts us? On our backs sometimes in order that we might look upwards sickness presents an opportunity for us to reassess things it causes us to think about what really matters how short life is and what we're going to do with it and James tells us that if someone is sick as a result of God's intervening loving hand if they have sinned, notice he says if, not since. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. This prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, verse 15. Well, perhaps you're not convinced. But uh, look at the example that James gives uh, of the prayer of the righteous man, that of uh, Elijah in the verses to follow, whom we're told, and it's worth noting, was an ordinary man, an ordinary human being, just like you or me. Verse 17, James says Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now if James is solely talking about prayer for physical healing in the verses leading up to this illustration, there are better examples he might have used than this one from the life of the Old Testament prophet Elijah. For example, in 1 Kings 17, we read of the widow of Zarephath's son who had died who, as a result of Elijah's prayers, was restored back to life. If James wanted to illustrate the power of prayer to heal physical illness, then surely that was the go-to event. But instead, he uses the example of a prayer which first resulted in a drought, and the second that ended it. So, what's going on here? Well, if we consider the Old Testament context of the event that James is mentioning, we see that through Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, God warned his people that if they persisted in sin and ignored him and his law, that well, they would be subject to his judgment. He uses this example to illustrate that the church that he's writing to, where some are sick, are encountering the intervening loving hand of God to bring them back to himself. Israel, the Old Testament church, had gone off the rails good and proper, and after repeated attempts to get them to change, eventually God sent his man Elijah to put into effect his promise. Elijah prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then God, in his mercy, moved Elijah to pray for the drought to be lifted, and it was. And so we see a parallel with the life of the church that James is speaking to. 
where someone has gone off the track in their walk with the Lord and God has lovingly acted to go after the wayward Christian, maybe by bringing physical sickness in the hope of bringing them to repentance that they might know forgiveness. He's acting to change their direction so that they might be restored. And so the elders of the church come in and pray for forgiveness and restoration and God answers those prayers. He will intervene in order that they might be healed, restored to relationship with him and that they might go on to bear spiritual fruit just as the irrigated land would bear physical fruit in the day of Elijah. And so if this passage is primarily about physical sickness that has resulted um, from spiritual waywardness, which needs repenting of, then verses 19 and 20 are not simply a tack on. They're not simply an addition, a, a PS, as they first seem. Rather, they follow quite naturally. Verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them. The same word as heal in verse 15. Save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. James is informing the church and us that we're to be concerned in reaching and reconciling the backslidden and the lost just as God is. What else are we celebrating this coming Easter other than the fact that God sent his son into the world to save the world, to reconcile us to himself? James is concluding, and so must we, by explaining that we have a responsibility for one another Indeed, these final verses serve to highlight the importance of uh, accountability, of small groups, of all-member ministry. James says, we're in this together, guys. We have to do this together. We're all to concern ourselves with the pastoral care of the flock. We're blessed to have a wonderful pastoral care team here at Lansdowne Baptist Church. But pastoral care, James says, is not to be left to a few. It's the task of the whole community who keep warm together, who pray for one another, who are accountable to one another, who confess their sins to each other, verse 16, not publicly, but privately, or indeed to the elders should they need to intervene. James is remembering again the, the early church, the good old days, the church who devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We read every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. James encourages his readers and he encourages us to authentic, holistic Christian community where we love God and love one another, where we concern ourselves with the priority of prayer, where there's a spirit of openness and accountability amongst its members, where we look out for one another and for the needs of others. James's conclusion appeals to the church to which he's writing and to us at Lansdowne Baptist Church today to live lives that are focused on God and on one another. Shall we pray?
Our gracious Heavenly Father, your word challenges us tonight. It, it challenges us about our, our prayer lives, about our vulnerability, our humility, our accountability. It challenges us to live lives that are centered on Christ and concerned about the welfare of others. Grant us grace, Lord, and the help of the Holy Spirit to live lives that are obedient to your word, that we would be a congregation that is prayerful, vulnerable, watchful, and real. Help us to be a community that's a blessing to, to each other, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.